Okay, hi everyone, welcome to lecture 6 of MD6028. Um, what we're going to talk about today is viral pathogenesis. So we've gone through the lectures where we're discussing core virology concepts, those concepts relating to genome expression and genome replication and the nature of viruses themselves. And what we're going to do now is move on to look at viruses in the context of infectious disease. And again, this is really viral pathogenesis, isn't it? Because what we say, um, so what we mean when we say viral pathogenesis is the ability of viruses to cause disease when they're infecting a host. And that's what this next portion of the module is going to be about. And this first lecture of this new portion is again going to be defining some key concepts making sure we understand some of the ideas that are central to the ability of viruses to cause disease. And these are some of the key areas that we're going to be working through. So first off, we're going to get our definitions established relating to viral pathogenesis. Then we're going to talk about some specific stages of the life cycle that are particularly relevant being attachment and entry. Then we're going to talk about something called virulence. Then we're going to talk about some other ideas, including direct and indirect pathogenesis. And also we're going to specifically look at oncogenic viruses. So we're going to look at the ability of some specific viruses to actually cause transformation of cells, which is a process that leads to cancer formation. Okay, so one thing that's important to note is when we're talking about viral pathogenesis, we're talking about a process that is equivalent to bacterial pathogenesis or fungal pathogenesis or the pathogenesis that's associated with any type of microorganism that can infect a host. So we're talking about a type of infectious disease here because, again, the causative agent is infecting the host. And by infecting the host, it is causing specific disease symptoms. Again, this is what pathogenesis looks like in infectious disease. If we were looking at non-infectious disease, so things like you know, diabetes and most cancers and things like that, we're looking at a very, very different type of pathogenesis. Um, we need to think about this in terms of what interventions we're going to use, because again, if we're comparing infectious disease to non-communicable disease, we're looking at very, very different types of intervention. And one primary focus of intervention in infectious disease and what we're talking about now, viral disease, which is a part of infectious disease, um, is clearing infection. So one real um, significant goal of interventions is to clear the infection. And what we mean by this is to get rid of the microorganism from the body. So to stop the virus from spreading throughout the body, stop the virus from replicating, and therefore ultimately reaching a point where there's no infectious virus left in an individual. And we can therefore consider infection cleared. Um, it's not always possible to do this. We've explored in past lectures the problems associated with um, attempts to clear um, retroviral infection, for example, also some herpes virus infections. So it's just with our current technology and the current um, arsenal that we have, we're not capable of clearing all infections. So whilst clearing infection is the ultimate goal of therapeutic interventions, hopefully, and we hope for all infectious diseases to reach a point where we can clear infection, current therapeutic interventions aren't sufficient to clear all infections. For many of these infections, however, we can control the infection. So when we're talking about viral infections, we're talking about suppressing the viral replication cycle and again, therefore controlling the infection. Um, there's another approach we can take, which is essentially symptomatic um, in the sense that we're targeting the symptoms of the viral infection. And again, what we tend to be doing here is we're not targeting the infection directly, but again, controlling the symptoms. So we're not targeting the viral replication cycle we're targeting the symptoms. And again, one clear example of this would be um, if we think about a virus infecting in a host that's causing inflammation, an individual can be prescribed anti-inflammatories to suppress 
the inflammation. They can be given painkillers to control the pain that's associated with the infection. These aren't necessarily contributing directly to um, the ability to clear infection in the sense that they're not therapeutic interventions that are targeted towards clearing infection. They're not targeting the viral replication cycle. However, they are controlling the symptoms. And again, we can contrast these to the curative treatments, which are actually targeting the viral replication cycle. And this is what antivirals tend to be. So when we traditionally think about antivirals, we're talking about drugs that specifically target the viral replication cycle, because again, this is how the virus can hopefully be cleared from the host. One concept that I know we're all familiar with intuitively, but that we need to explore scientifically, is this idea that different viruses are associated with different disease states. So different viruses cause different diseases in a host is a different way of thinking about that. And we need to understand the actual scientific basis of this difference. So why is it influenza causes one type of disease state, whereas hepatitis B virus infection causes a different type of disease state and poliovirus infection causes another disease state? Because all we've really said about viruses in terms of the meta in the way they cause disease is some of the ideas that we've defined. We haven't actually looked at the specific mechanisms by which different viruses cause disease, and that's what we need to do. Again, look at the specific mechanisms for the different diseases. We don't need to remember dozens and dozens of examples. It's more about understanding the principle, um, and that's what we're going to do. We're looking to look at the key principles and have these established. Um, I've got some examples on the slides, which goes some way to hinting at why these differences in different viruses exist. So why do different viruses cause different diseases? And essentially, it comes down to differences within their life cycle. We've talked about viral life cycles and how all viruses complete a life cycle that is very similar in the sense that it has the same key stages. However, the way in which each of these stages is completed differs and this is where the difference in disease state comes from. So all viruses will attach to a host cell, then enter, then replicate, producing copies of themselves, which assemble and then leave the host cell. However, the details of each of these stages change. Initially, as we can see on the left, we have the example of tropism. This means essentially viruses will be able to infect different cell types. So different cell types will be susceptible to different types of infection and they'll also be permissive to different um, so it's different types of virus. And so that determines what cells viruses can actually productively infect. And the cell type that is infected has a large um, link to the type of disease that is seen. There's this idea of viruses being lytic versus non-lytic. So some viruses cause direct lysis of the cells they infect. And the disease state is a consequence of this. So if you think about poliovirus, it causes lysis of uh, motor neurons and this causes a loss of motor function. So this is a very specific disease state that's characteristic of poliovirus and that is clearly linked to its ability to directly lyse these cells. Immune response. So different viruses will induce different types of immune response and the immune response that is induced can sometimes be um, heavily involved in the specific disease symptoms that are experienced. And this is an idea that we've explored before, this idea that a lot of infectious diseases, the pathogenesis is actually linked to the immune response. And what we're doing here is we're introducing a little bit more complexity by saying different viruses can induce different types of immune response. And this can be linked to the type of disease that is actually seen. Chronic versus acute. So if we're thinking about disease state, we have to think about whether it's an acute disease, so an immediate disease or a chronic long term disease. And again, this comes down to the life cycle. We've looked at viruses that have the ability to integrate into the genome, go into this silent state. Um, if we think about HPV as well, it doesn't integrate, but it has those circles of DNA and the circles of DNA um, can essentially sit in the nucleus for a long time. So this is a very specific part of its life cycle that other viruses don't engage in. And that is, again, linked to the specific type of disease HPV causes because it's linked to this idea of chronicity. So this long term infection.
latency. Again, specifically when we're looking at viruses that can either integrate into the host cell genome or otherwise form latent kind of choir infection reservoirs, we have to think about this idea of latency. We have to think about this idea of recurrence infection infections. And again, closely linked to the life cycle because again it's linked to this idea of whether or not the virus integrates its genome into the host cell or has some other mechanism of maintaining a silent reservoir in some cell types and we also have to consider viral variants so we refer to viral species sometimes as being one single thing so this is this species and then this is this species and any members of this species are all the same and any members of this other species are in the same in their group um, but actually what we see is there's a lot more variation amongst viruses which is perhaps something we should expect considering their fast replication rate um, so each particular viral species will actually often include a range of different variants and there's a lot of variety there and the variants are actually very different in the type of disease and often severity of disease they cause and sometimes sometimes and again this isn't always true but there's some specific species where we see quite a lot of variation in the type of disease caused and the severity of disease caused and if you want a clear example of that we can think of um, uh, influenza virus right if we think about h x so h number and n x so n number so all these different strains of influenza virus that obviously have a very very different ability to cause disease okay and we see two things here so there's all these differences firstly as we've said it's linked to different pathogenicity and pathogenicity um, if you want to define this we can say the way that disease is caused so the type of disease that's caused. And then we can also say there's varied virulence. So virulence is the capacity of disease cause. So how severe disease is caused is another way to think about this. So pathogenicity, really the type of disease and the way that disease is caused. And virulence, um, the ability of the virus to cause severe disease or less severe disease. So what we want to do now is look at some examples and kind of solidify the idea that those factors we've just considered linked to the viral replication cycle can in turn be linked to the way viruses cause disease. So we can think about norovirus, which is a member of the Colicoviridae family here. Um, it essentially infects the intestinal brush border, so it enters via some specific receptors um, and once it is inside these cells, it engages in a lytic replication cycle. So it causes lysis of the cells it infects. And in doing so, it disrupts the internal environment. So it prevents the intestinal um, absorption of liquid from the lumen. Therefore, liquid stays in the lumen and individuals suffer from diarrhea and the other uh, uh, symptoms that can be associated with localized infection of the lower GI tract. Um, so again, this is all linked to the ability of the virus to cause lysis of the intestinal brush border cells. Okay, we have hepatitis B virus here. So hepatitis B virus infect hepatocytes. So hepatocytes being liver cells and hepatitis being inflammation of the liver because infection of these hepatocytes with HPV, um, HPV um, causes inflammation because inflammation is the immune response. Um, as part of this immune response, cytotoxic T lymphocytes will essentially target the infected cells. So hepatitis B virus isn't a lytic virus. It doesn't kill the hepatocytes when it infects them. It just exists within these cells replicating. It's the immune response to the presence of the virus that actually causes pathology. And again, the immune response targets these infected cells. And this targeting is characterized by inflammation, which is, um, uh, again, hepatitis, right? That's what itis is inflammation um, and long-term hepatitis can lead to more significant damage which is characterized as cirrhosis which is essentially liver scarring so again the liver scarring this significant um, disease symptom 
that is characteristic of HPV infection is actually occurring as a consequence of the immune response to infection. So this example here is a clear example of how the immune response can be involved in the specific pathology of a viral infection. So next you want to consider influenza. So influenza virus infects um, epithelial cells of the respiratory tract and in doing so it induces an immune response. So it is a lytic infection, so it can kill these infected cells. However, this is not primarily what causes the disease symptoms, it's primarily the immune response again. So it'll be localized inflammation and also wider responses triggered by cytokine activation, which is again a consequence of the virus being present in these cells. So another example of the immune response being implicated in the specific pathogenesis of a virus. HIV. So HIV is a virus we've talked about before quite a bit. Um, I'm sure we're familiar now with the idea that HIV is infecting immune cells. Um, when it's infecting immune cells, it's doing two different things. One, it's inducing lysis of these cells, so it will directly lyse immune cells. And this plays a part in the ability of HIV to cause immune cell depletion, which is really the end point of HIV infection. If HIV infection persists untreated, then th there is a loss of immune cells. And again, this is immune cell depletion. Um, but there's another factor which is more important than the direct lysis by HIV, which is the widespread activation of the immune system by HIV. So HIV is activating the immune system and causing a large number of immune cells to be, again, activated. And these activated immune cells actually have a half-life, so they can't stay activated forever. They only last for maybe a couple of days. Um, and then they're not effective and ultimately die. And so because of this constant stimulation of the immune system, so this hyperactivation, the immune system has a real difficult time keeping up with producing all these cells. So actually maintaining this constant activation and ultimately um, th the system just doesn't function anymore. The number of cells that are being depleted can't be, replace can't be replaced with new cells. So again, with HIV, it's the same case where immune activation is clearly implicit in the disease symptoms because here immune activation is directly contributing to the depletion of the immune system and again this is the disease state of HIV isn't it it's immune depletion which we can define as um, AIDS so acquired immunodeficiency syndrome okay so rhabdoviruses as well we have rabies virus notable family member here um, so it infects nerve cells and it directly moves up nerve cells. So again, qu quite strange pathogenesis, but linked to the type of cell that's being infected, isn't it? Again, like HIV, HIV is specifically infecting immune cells. And this is where the immune side of the pathology comes in. Um, so for HIV, we can think the pathology is linked to its ability to induce immune activation and its ability to lyse cells and the fact that it is specifically infecting immune cells, right? Um, if we think about rabies virus, it's infecting um, uh, nerve cells. And again, we're gonna see the pathology is linked to this because the infection will migrate up nerve cells towards the brain. And when it reaches the brain and the base of the spinal cord, um, or st yeah, the stem of the spinal cord, it's causing disease symptoms there because it is causing um, direct inflammation because again the virus is replicating in these cells and is causing inflammation um, and this inflammation is causing neurological symptoms so if you look at the symptoms of rabies virus infection you can see they're quite quite strange um, not traditional viral symptoms in the sense that they don't seem to be as much physical symptoms as they are more neurological type cognitive symptoms. And again, this is why it's because the infection is of nerve cells and it migrates up to the brain. And by causing inflammation in this region, it is resulting in cognitive symptoms. So again, hopefully we can see now that when a virus is causing disease, we can actually fairly easily explain why it's causing the specific type of disease it is. And what we're really doing is just breaking down 
the way it infects. So breaking down the replication cycle and looking at the different factors we have on the slide here. So when we're interested in the particular infectious disease and we're looking into the literature, these are the questions we can start thinking about. So what's the tropism? What type of cell is infected? Is it a lytic infection or non-lytic? What immune response are we looking at? Is it a chronic infection or acute? Is there latency? And are there potential differences across any viral variants? And if we understand all this information, then we should really get a good idea of how the virus is specifically causing disease again. Okay, so one particular important point is this idea of attachment and entry in the viral replication cycle. So we've said viral tropism is important and we saw the type of cell that a virus is infecting and this is largely determined by attachment and entry so not completely but largely determined by attachment and entry so this is what we want to look at now so again this idea of tropism largely comes down to the first stage of the life cycle but not completely and that's something we're going to look at now so a big factor in tropism is this idea of susceptibility and susceptibility essentially means are the correct receptors present on a cell for a particular virus so if a particular cell type has receptors that a specific virus can bind to then that specific virus can potentially infect that cell type again we've looked at different viruses attached to specific receptors and that's how they initially engage with the cell and this engagement which we call attachment is the first step of the viral replication cycle so we can say that the correct receptor type is um, we can perhaps say it's necessary but not sufficient for infection so it's necessary for a cell to have the correct receptors for a particular virus to attach to it and infect However, it's not sufficient because there's other things that need to happen as well. But a virus can't even begin to interact with a cell if the appropriate receptors aren't there. And again, this is why if we look in the literature, we can often see the viruses infecting specific cells because of the receptors present. And we don't always know the receptors. We don't know exactly which receptors all viruses bind to. But for a lot of viruses, we do most viruses that we're interested in from a research perspective really and the clearest example we have is of course HIV isn't it because HIV is specifically binding to CD4 that's the receptor and that is why HIV specifically infects CD4 plus cells which are T cells in the immune system there's also the fact of co-receptors so cells with the right receptors will also have the right co-receptors if a virus is to engage with that cell successfully. So viruses can only infect cells with the right receptors and if the virus requires co-receptors, the right co-receptors should be present also. So for HIV, there's co-receptors like CCR5 and CXCR4 and these are essentially elements on the surface of the cell that the virus interacts with after it's interacted with the main receptor. So there's the main interaction between the virus and the receptor, but there's also lesser interactions, but they are still important interactions that occur between the virus and the co-receptors. And again, as we've seen, the type of disease a virus cause, causes is largely linked to the type of cell it infects and the type of cell viruses can infect. Um, is in part determined by this process of attachment. Um, so this idea of whether or not a cell is susceptible to infection. Because if a cell doesn't have the right or the appropriate types of receptors, then it's not susceptible. Okay, and again, if the cell is unsusceptible, binding doesn't occur, so this attachment doesn't occur, and this is the first step of infection, so there's no infection in the cell type the cell must be susceptible, so it must have the right type of receptors. Okay, so there's also this idea of cells being permissive to infection. So we've said cells can be susceptible to infection if they have the right receptors, 
but there's other stages after that. So susceptibility is necessary, but it's not sufficient to enable full infection. And permissivity is another piece in the puzzle. So it's something in addition to susceptibility that contributes to whether or not a particular cell type is actually um, infectable by a virus, so whether there is tropism there. Um, Permissivity essentially refers to all the intracellular processes and extracellular processes that occur after attachment and entry. So we can say if a virus is able to infect, able to attach to a cell, so the cell is susceptible, then we can say, okay, what happens once it enters into the cell and what happens as it's leaving the cell? The key question is, are the infectious particles that are produced viable? So is the infection a productive infection? Is it able to produce infectious virus particles that can continue to infect other cells? And if the answer is yes, then the cell type is permissive. And again, at this point, we're saying we're assuming it's susceptible because the virus is attached and entered. And next we say, OK, is it permissive? So can the virus that has entered actually make copies of itself that can then leave and infect new cell types? And if the answer is yes, then the cell is permissive to infection. Because in theory, we can take any cell type in a Petri dish in the lab and force it to express particular receptors. So we can force any old cell type to express CD4 really, which will enable HIV to attach to the cell and enter in. But whether or not HIV once it's in the cell can actually make copies of itself is a different question. Because again, it comes down to this idea of permissivity. And if we want to think about permissivity, we have this really clear example with influenza virus. So as we've said, influenza virus infects epithelial cells. So it's able to attach to surface receptors and epithelial cells. Then it's able to enter into the cells and make copies of itself. Now, these copies, once they're made, leave the cell. And as they leave, they're processed by an enzyme called protease clara, which is released by neighboring cells. Now, if the influenza virus was infecting another cell type in a different part of the body, then the infectious particles that are produced would not be exposed to this protease clara as they leave, which means they would not be um, fully processed and they would not be able to continue infection. They would not be viable. Therefore, epithelial cells of the respiratory tract are permissive to influenza virus infection, whilst cells in other parts of the body are not, even though they are epithelial cells in other parts of the body. Because again, this idea of permissivity comes down to whether or not the full infectious cycle is completed. And the full infectious cycle has to end in virus particles that are complete and capable of continuing infection. And again, this is the case in epithelial cells of the respiratory tract because the virus, influenza virus, attaches to the cell, enters in, makes copies of itself, then these copies leave. And as they leave, they are processed by protease clara into their active form. And then in this active infectious form, they can then go on and continue infection. So there's permissivity and there's also susceptibility. Now, you might also see this a term called um, accessibility. And accessibility is the final piece when we're thinking about tropism. So again, tropism is whether or not a virus can infect a particular cell type. Is it, tropis, is it tropic for that cell type? We've talked about susceptibility and permissivity. Um, accessibility is the third point, and it's a really easy one. It just means does the virus actually have access to the cell to the, to the particular cell type? So um, if um, we have uh, influenza virus, for example, is the example we've been using, um, it has access to the epithelial cells, right? Because it enters through the respiratory tract. So if we think about influenza virus and epithelial cells of the respiratory tract, the cells are susceptible because they have the receptors. They're permissive because they can produce active um, virus particles when infected. And they're accessible because the way the virus enters into the host brings it into contact with this cell type. So these three factors add up to the idea of tropism. OK. OK, and now we want to discuss virulence. So to define virulence, we can say it's the um, severity of the disease caused by a microorganism or the capability of the microorganism to cause severe disease is another way to consider it.
Okay, so again, similar term to pathogenicity and there is overlap, but really here we're talking about how severe the disease is. So what's the degree of disease that is caused? Um, there's various um, factors that impact virulence and what we really want to do is look at a few of these different ones. Some of these factors are host determinants, so they're factors that are intrinsic to the host that determine the type of, sorry, the severity of the disease that is experienced. But many of these factors are um, viral factors. Um, for example, virulence genes, so these are genes that are um, encoded by a virus that determine the severity of the disease that is caused. Okay, when we're talking about virulence genes, we need to consider that there are four different types of virulence genes. And any particular gene that is encoded by a virus that, Im that um, impact virulence can often fulfill more than one of these roles. Okay, so a virulence gene can essentially do any of these things, but many of them will do actually do multiple of these things. So a virulence gene can, for example, enhance viral replication. So if a gene enhances the ability of a virus to replicate, it makes it more efficient at um, inducing disease. So again, it's increasing its virulence. Virulence genes can also counteract the immune response. Um, whilst we've looked at examples of how the immune system can actually contribute to a disease state, we also have to consider that the purpose of the immune system is to suppress viral replication. And many virulence genes will actually counteract the suppressive ability of the immune system and in doing so will enhance the ability of the virus to replicate and cause disease. Some virulence genes, once expressed, will have direct toxic effects upon the host. We'll look at some examples of these. And some will also enhance the spread of the virus. So it will enable the virus to spread more effectively from cell to cell and ultimately from host to host. So we have an example here. So it's a herpes virus protein. It's ICP 3.4.5. Um, essentially, if you delete this gene, from the viral genome, you see the virus is significantly attenuated, so it's not capable of replicating and causing disease to the same degree. So during herpes virus infection, what essentially happens is a cellular factor, so an immune factor called PKR, recognizing products of viral um, genomic processes. And once this is recognized, there is an inactivation of elongation factor 2A. Um, this is done by phosphorylation, so PKR is essentially phosphorylating EIF 2A. And in doing so, it is preventing translation, so it's preventing protein synthesis. ICP 34.5 again is a herpes virus protein, and this inactivates protein phosphatase 1A. And what protein phosphatase 1A does is dephosphorylates EIF 2A, so it reverses the activity of PKR. Because again, PKR is activated by the presence of viral factors. Once PKR is activated, it inactivates EIF 2A. And once EIF 2A is inactivated, protein synthesis is inhibited. And ICP 34.5 essentially reverses all this by activating protein phosphatase 1A. Okay, and again, the purpose of PKR here is to suppress viral replication because it's preventing protein synthesis, right? It's inhibiting translation. And the purpose of the viral protein ICP34.5 is to reverse this. So if we think about our um, section on the right hand side of the slide where we can think about the functions of virulence genes, we can say that ICP34.5 enhances viral replication by promoting expression because it's enabling translation to occur. And it also counteracts the immune response because it's directly counteracting the um, suppression that is put in place by PKR. Okay, so a clear example there. We have another example here, which is NSP4. So NSP4 is produced by rotaviruses. It's considered an exotoxin. So again, most exotoxins are produced by bacteria. 
but NSP4 is an example of a, of a exotoxin that's released by viruses, again, specifically rotaviruses. And what NSP4 is doing is it functions as an enterotoxin, so it impacts the enteric environment. And what it is doing is disrupting the local environment, causing specific pathology. And in doing so, um, it's essentially enhancing the viral spread because it's inducing diarrhea. Again, we're talking about the enteric um, environment and disruption here invariably results in almost invariably results in diarrhea in the context of lower GI tract infections and again by inducing this NSP4 is directly both having a toxic effect upon the host this impact in the localized cells and in doing so it's inducing diarrhea and by inducing diarrhea it's fulfilling point four here because it's enhancing viral spread Okay, so that's what we want to talk about virulence. So again, when we're thinking about viral pathogenesis, we're thinking about the different ways viruses can cause disease. And one important part of this is pathogenesis, which is what we talked about when we're looking at the viral replication cycle. But another part is virulence. So again, looking at the severity of disease. And obviously these two concepts are really, really tightly linked. And it can be actually quite difficult to pull them apart in our mind. But the best way to think of it is pathogenesis um, the type of disease that's caused pathogenicity is the virus's ability to cause this type of disease and virulence is the severity or degree of disease caused. So really closely related concepts, um, but it is useful for us to understand the distinctions. OK, so now we want to discuss this idea of direct and indirect pathogenesis. So we want to consider direct and indirect pathogenesis. So again, you, you've covered this in other modules, I know, and you've covered it in the past. So this is just going to be a quick reminder, but it's such a crucial idea, such a crucial concept that we need to um, refresh it. Um, and we've talked about it a little bit today. We've even looked at some examples. And again, the concept here is that viruses, like other microorganisms, can potentially cause disease directly. So again, through their direct impact on cells or tissues or host processes, or they can cause disease directly, indirectly by impacting those same processes, but doing it via the action of the immune system. So we have direct pathogenesis and indirect pathogenesis. And again, all the processes we're looking at today, all the concepts and principles are really tightly linked. So this is something we've kind of touched on from other perspectives, but we want to shine a light on it here and say, OK, there can be indirect forms of pathogenesis and direct forms of pathogenesis. So the direct forms we've looked at include uh, poliovirus infection. Um, poliovirus infects motor neurons and causes lysis. Um, indirect forms of pathogenesis, uh, the clearest example of, is hepatitis B virus, isn't it? Um, we think about rabies virus as well, so inflammation of the brain um, when there's a um, rabies virus infection that's worked its way up the nerve cells. Uh, often what we see in many infections is it's a mix between the two. So the specific disease state of an infection is caused both by direct pathogenesis and also indirect pathogenesis. And HIV is quite a clear example of that, isn't it? We can also think about influenza. So influenza does directly lyse epithelial cells, but pathogenesis is largely because of the immune response. So there's a bit of a balance. And again, cytolysis, clearest example of direct pathogenesis. So viruses infecting cells and causing the lysis of these cells and therefore causing disease symptoms. As we said, poliovirus, clear example. HIV is another example, but as we know, the immune response is also heavily implicit in the pathology associated with HIV infection. Rotavirus, so we've just looked at rotavirus and seen how it's able to cause lysis of the cells lining um, the lower GI tract. So these enteric cells that we can call enterocytes. So again, this is direct pathogenesis and the lysis of these cells causes malabsorption of fluids. So this fluid stays in the lumen and is experienced as diarrhea. For indirect pathogenesis, there's a lot going on here. Um, we've looked at some examples to date when we're talking about viral infections. The clearest example is inflammation. 
because a localized viral infection will be met by an inflammatory response from the immune system and this inflammation um, is often part of disease symptoms. Okay, so that's direct and indirect pathogenesis. Again, just to refresh really or a recap, um, what we want to consider finally is something that's a little bit different to the other ideas we've looked at today. So it does fit the rules and it fits the principles of viral pathogenesis we've talked about, but it's so specific that it's worth looking at distinctly. And this is viral oncogenesis, so the oncogenic viruses. Now, as you can tell from the name, we're talking about viruses that cause um, transformation of cells leading to cancer formation or tumor formation. Again, onco, cancer, genic, genesis or something, viruses. So as I'm sure we're aware, some viruses are capable of inducing tumor genesis. Um, and that's what we're gonna look at now. So we need to distinguish between um, tumor formation and transformation. So transformation is a cellular process um, that comes before tumor formation, so actual oncogenesis. So a healthy cell can be induced into a state where it replicates in an uncontrolled manner. This is transformation. And obviously transformation is a prerequisite for the formation of tumors because a tumor is the, the end product of an uncontrolled cell proliferating continually until there is a mass of cells. And again, obviously for this to occur, first transformation must occur. So a switch from a normal healthy cell with a controlled replication cycle to a cell that is replicating in an uncontrolled manner. So it's undergoing um, uncontrolled proliferation, essentially. Um, Various processes can lead to transformation, and one of the processes can be viral infection. So some viruses have the ability to, again, induce transformation of infected cells. And when we're talking about uncontrolled proliferation, what we're talking about is progression through this cell cycle on the right. So I know you're familiar with the cell cycle. It's the processes. Um, it's obviously it's a circular set of processes because reproduction can occur over and over and over again. And for, that, for a cell to make a copy of itself, it engages in this string of processes. So it completes this circle and it therefore replicates. Now, in a healthy cell, this is a very, very well controlled um, cycle. So cells will only progress to the next stage at specific points. There are very, very specific signals required for this to happen. And again, this enables um, our um, systems to engage in a controlled replicative state. So these cells are replicating, but it's in a controlled manner. However, what transformation is, is a switch from controlled progression through this cycle to uncontrolled progression. So uncontrolled proliferation is another way we can say this. The cells are just proliferating, they're replicating, replicating, replicating with no control. And again, this is what can lead to tumor formation. Now there are specific mechanisms by which viruses um, can cause this and we're going to look at some of these in a later lecture. I'm not going to focus them on them today because it's quite complex. We have to go into a little bit of cancer cell biology, um, which is a little bit of a shift from the kind of thing we're, we've been talking about. So we'll jump into that a bit later. But I wanted to introduce this today because obviously it's completely relevant to uh, viral pathogenesis. Okay, right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, as always, please come to the tutorial Monday. I'm ready to um, ask any questions you may want to ask. Um, we'll work through the tutorial as we usually do. Um, the difference is this week it will be face to face. So I'd encourage you um, to familiarize yourself with the room where we're going to be. It should be in your timetable. Um, any issues with finding the room, any issues with anything like that on the practical side of things, just let me know and we'll figure it out. Okay, thanks very much.